Everything in okay. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, as you are coming in, please let us know where you're tuning in from. We always like to know uh, where folks are watching from. Um, I am in West Hartford, right over the border, of, but only a mile away from, from the Mark Twain house. Um, and I'm sure we have plenty of people from Connecticut and, and more from, from afar. Uh, so please let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, and I'll just get started. Hi, I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the Literary Program Coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. Thank you for joining us for this virtual program for The Mysterious Case of Rudolph Diesel, Genius, Power, and Deception on the Eve of World War I. Um, I want to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with the support honoring the Lake Frank Lord. Um, and we are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Hope Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR. Please consider supporting our museum by becoming a member. Uh, please visit our website for more information on membership. And now on to our guests. Our author, Douglas Brunt, is the New York Times bestselling author of Ghosts the Means and Trophy Son, and host of top rated Sirius XM author podcast dedicated with Doug Brunt. Our moderator, Gareth Russell, is a historian, novelist, and playwright. He was educated at Oxford University and Queen's University of Belfast. He is the author of The Ship of Dreams Young and Damned and Fair, The Emperors, and an Illustrated Introduction to the Tudors. In addition to, be, uh, to being a commentator and royal expert, he is the host of the podcast Single Malt History. Um, and uh, we encourage you to have a conversation in the chat. If you have a question, please post that into the Q&A section. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, I'll be putting a link in the chat to purchase uh, the mysterious case of Rudolf Diesel. Uh, so that is all from me. Please sit back and enjoy it. I'll turn this over to Doug and Gareth. Great, thank you so much. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, and I suppose to begin with, it is we're dealing with the most famous person that people have constantly heard of and not heard of at the same time. So few surnames I think appear as often in the world as Diesel, and certainly very few uh, surnames appear without the knowledge that they're also surnames. In perfect uh, timing for this uh, webinar, it was 110 years ago this week that contemporary fame and uh, posthumous oblivion intersected for Rudolf Diesel, an event which forms the beginning and the end of Doug Brunt's thrilling, and it genuinely is thrilling, this isn't just um, publisher politess and critically acclaimed new biography. <laughs> the mysterious case of Rudolf Diesel, genius power and deception on the eve of World War One a book which places Diesel back at the heart of the Edwardian era, where he attracted the not always welcome attention of Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II and a different kind of emperor in America's John D. Rockefeller. So Doug, what happened on that night at sea 110 years ago and how did it birth the, the mystery of Rudolf Diesel? Now that, that's, so you, as you point out, it's almost 110 years to the day, September 29. So if we go back to that time, September 29th, 1913, we're really on the eve of World War I. And diesel at that time, as you were saying, we all know the word diesel now. We often misspell it with a lowercase d. It's, it's the man, it is a surname. Rudolf Diesel did this. And we don't know the man's name now as much. His history has really been paved over this last hundred years. But at that time, he was a huge celebrity. And, and to put it in today's terms, it would be almost as though Elon Musk went dis disappeared overnight. So September 29, 1913, Rudolf Diesel is traveling from Belgium to Great Britain on an overnight passenger ferry. And he's traveling with two companions, allegedly. They have dinner on the ship, on a, you know, the old style steamship. And they make plans to have breakfast in the morning. They go to their staterooms to sleep. And in the morning, he's gone. He's disappeared. They search the ship. They hold it at sea. All they find are his hat and his coat neatly folded at the stern of the ship, uh, you know, allegedly marking the point where he jumped off the sea, uh, jumped off into the sea. And it's clear that it wasn't uh, an accident. He wasn't sleepwalking. It was a very calm night. The seas were calm. There was no wind. So it wasn't as though he got up and was washed over. Um, but 
the prevailing thought at the time is suicide. So when they finally get to port in Great Britain, the newspapers go wild around the world with this, from the New York Times in America to all the papers in Western Europe to Russia. It's splashed in the headlines that the great inventor has disappeared strangely. And so while they presume suicide, there are two theories of murder that also emerge. As you mentioned, one is that Kaiser Wilhelm II of the Emperor of Germany had dispatched agents to kill Rudolf. And the other was that John Rockefeller or agents of big oil, perhaps a Pinkerton detective thug type, was sent to kill Diesel. And as I explore the motive that each of these men had, because Diesel was an existential threat to both, as you explore the, the motives that each had to kill him, you really get a sense of the time and what was happening in the world in 1913. And it sets up the structure of the book and the mystery of the book. Well, one of the, I mean, you mentioned the time and the setting, and that is something that comes through so vibrantly in the book. And really, the way in which Diesel's life parallels through this building, this countdown to a terrible global war. And one of the things, I mean, I say Diesel was very much, he, to me, he's in your book emblematic of this period, but he's also something of an outsider. I mean, he, his childhood is passed initially in Third Empire era Paris, where he and his family are sort of regarded with suspicion by their neighbors as Prussian German mm -hmm. sympathizers, even though they're Bavarian. And there's probably very few things more insulting to a 19th century Bavarian than to be called a Prussian. Um, actually, probably Bavarians today would be horrified by it now that I think about it. And he um, he's later a refugee with his family in late Victorian London. So there's that sort of um, national isolation, slightly, or being an outsider. But there's also common to the lives of many geniuses, but it really came across in, in this book, the way in which his genius sort of left Rudolf feeling a bit isolated from people around him all the time. So how did that childhood of being you know, someone of great capabilities, but also exposed to the sense of being an outsider ship him. That's a great point. And, and in the book, he, he really comes to life as this three-dimensional character that you come to care about because you understand this journey he's been on through his youth and into middle age. And as you point out, he's from Bavaria, which at this time, it, the, the German state, as we've come to know it in the 20th century, does not yet exist. It's really 39 or so Germanic kingdoms and tribes and things that are rallied together, led by Prussia and Bismarck to you know, consolidate into a unified Germany. And so Diesel's heritage, his parents were from Bavaria, one of these Germanic kingdoms, and they emigrated to Paris in 1850. He was born in Paris in 1858. And his father was a, basically a bookbinder, worked with leather goods. And uh, you know, really since the time of Napoleon, there's been some tension between the French and these Germanic tribes. And, they had really fit in well, though. The Bavarians, as you say, very different from the Prussians. They felt culturally aligned with the French. But at the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, all people in France and in Paris of Germanic origin were, were uh, sent out. They were refugees. They, they caught a refugee ship over to London, where he lived really during the guts of the Industrial Revolution. He actually lived in the same neighborhood as where Charles Dickens set Oliver Twist, and he arrives at the same age as the title character. So he's 12 years old, living in tenement housing in London, and uh, and then gets a sort of a, a lifeline from a distant relative who offers to board him and put him in trade school where he can get an education back in Germany. So he leaves London after about nine months there, uh, having seen the worst, you know, kids his own age, not going to school, but, you know, marched off into factories and mills and things. So he goes back to Germany and get a, gets an education where, as you say, his, his genius brain comes alive. Uh, one of the benefits of his life to that time is he'd lived in, in the most hallowed places of engineering. You know, the Industrial Revolution started in England. It developed more in France. And then by the approach of the 19th century, Germany is really the hotbed for engineering. Um, and he he also really was kind of an outsider. All the family lore about him was that he was very much of a loner. He loved to draw. He loved to visit small technical museums. He had a favorite uh, childhood museum in Paris where he would spend his days looking at uh, uh, old versions of steam engines, you know, James Watt era steam engines and sketch them. And uh, it, it made him a bit of a, you know, a, 
he had there were very much two sides to him. He appreciated the arts. Uh, and I think at that time, most engineers felt a dual responsibility to be not only the engineer, but also a social theorist and to think of the the social implications for how their innovations could be applied to society in, in a good way. So he he was also, uh, and ironically, as, as much as we know the diesel engine today, when he uh, was near the end of his life, he felt he would be best remembered as a social theorist for his his social treatise on the sort of future of how humanity would would love and live. And it, I in the book, I liken it to Picasso, who who had remarked to a friend that, you know, while he was a great painter, history would me- remember him best as a great poet. You know, he'd written some poetry, and I think a, su- a few sycophantic fans said, well, you know, Pablo, this this poetry is fantastic. You know, this is how you're going to go down in history. So Diesel, of course, did not go down as a social theorist, uh, as as well-meaning as he was in that department. But you're right, he he had that, there there is a sense of other, and it, I think it comes off the page a little bit in the book. It's it's almost an endearing quality in a sense. It is. And I think, I mean, you mentioned some other traits that he loved to draw. Um I, I was, I mean, I, I was came second last in my school at drawing. The only kid who came below <laughs> me actually fell off his horse the week before and broke his wrist. So you needed to pulverize your drawing implements before you could be worse than me at drawing. So I was struck. I was not only jealous of his intellect, I was also jealous of how good an artist he was, which you've mentioned. Uh, there's a sketch in the book that really caught my attention, which was he drew when he was 16. And it's mm-hmm. off the crucified Christ. And it is absolutely extraordinary. So Diesel, the artist, as you say, I mean, like Diesel, the social theorist, is not something we tend to associate with his inventor. But that sort of artistic side of him, where did that come from? Was it nurtured? Was it nature? Was it a bit of both? A bit of both. uh, And he got a bit of, of, you know, this sort of dual thing he has, this parallel quality of engineer and social theorist, came from his parents as well. So while his father was a very strict disciplinarian, you know, you misbehave and you get the strap, that kind of a father, literally get the strap and very industrious and hardworking and disciplined, actually didn't want him to go get a higher education, wanted him to get back into the family workshop and start working. You know, he was going to do sort of the minimum amount of education and then get back an apprentice in the workshop. But on the mother's side, she was a governess. And at that time, the governess, it, it's different from what we think of today in the in the sense of a caregiver or nanny or something like that. In those days, someone with some means would hire a governess who would really take over the entire education and and sort of well-being of a child, would teach the music and the arts and languages and, and all of that. And his mother was a governess and very artistic, a beautiful piano player, a beautiful singing voice, and really taught him an appreciation for music and painting and sculpture. And so he had that from... Uh, both of his parents. And of course, living in Paris, it's the same. The sciences and the arts are all there. And he had a saying that drawing is the right hand of the engineer. And there were gorgeous items. There are only a couple in the book. As you say, he had he did a really impressive, during his teenage years, drawing of Christ on the cross. But in the archives in Augsburg uh, and others in Germany, there were many sketches of his that were really, you know, ladies dancing in Paris and other sketches along Parisian scenes of homes and interiors of homes. Um, so it was one of his great pastimes. So he was either drawing steam engines and mechanical gears or, or, or also frivolous fun things as well. Well, that's sort of, I mean, it's, that's really the Victorian period in a nutshell, frivolous and very serious all at once. And as the Victorian era draws to a close in the 1890s, that really seems to be a decade of tremendous achievement for Diesel. What, were his his greatest inventions and what i mean just sort of tie back a little bit to the social theorist point and the engineer what were his greatest inventions and what did he hope that they would be used for well the greatest of course is the engine but before i get into that i'll tell you one other one that seems ironic uh, although it is all in the thermodynamics category he studied in uh, in munich at university under carl von lind who's a, a pioneer of refrigeration and the, the company of his name still exists today. And you know, so this is back in the days just prior, you know, if you want to cold store things, you're looking for caves and other things to keep things cold. But Lynn built the first ice machine and refrigeration technology. And uh, Diesel worked for him. And people would say, well, you know, they would joke later, how does this guy 
who, who used to work in refrigeration, build a heat engine. And he would joke that the temperature of absolute zero is negative 273. Anything above that is heat. Uh, so as a result of working with Lynn, he, he, it all makes sense really in the end. Um, he was working with ammonia gases and other gases for the refrigeration technology, which was useful as a fuel in his early attempts at, at combustion engines. Um, but Prior to that, he actually invented the potable ice cube. So we could make ice and we could keep produce and meats and things like that cold, but no one had been able to develop an ice cube usable to serve in a bar or a restaurant. So he had the patent for that, uh, the first first applied for in, in France. But his greatest invention, of course, is the, the diesel engine. Um, by 1892, he filed his first patent on that and then a second in 1893 that revised it from a constant heat engine to a constant pressure engine. And this is getting a little geeky, but I think I can quickly explain the fundamental aspect of the engine, what makes it work and what I mean by constant pressure, which is if you imagine a bicycle tire pump, and if you've ever compressed that plunger down on a bicycle tire pump, and if you've done maybe a few tires, you start to feel the heat on the pump itself because compressed air gets hot. And so in university, he had seen a Tinder lighter, which looks like a bicycle tire pump, just a glass cylinder, a plunger to press down. And then inside the cylinder, you screw in a little piece of Tinder that can ignite. And if you jam that plunger down hard and fast enough, it compresses the air in such an extreme way that that Tinder will start to glow and light. And that's the concept of the diesel engine. It's compressed air. So the, the piston comes down hard and fast. That air that's already inside the cylinder gets compressed way down a thousand pounds per square inch. And at that amount of pressure, enough heat is created to ignite the fuel that would otherwise be completely stable. I mean, the one thing about diesel fuel is you can put a vat of it in a barrel, drop a lit match into a diesel, uh, a, a barrel of diesel fuel and nothing will happen. It's completely stable at room temperature, it doesn't have fumes. Uh, so diesel from this idea in university, seeing this tinder lighter, this little bicycle tire pump th looking thing comes up with the the core concept of the diesel engine, which is fundamentally unchanged to this day. And do you think, I mean, was his hope that it would be, I mean, I mean it's, it's almost a difficult question to ask because the uses of the diesel engine are mind blowing, the kind of the implications of it. Did he see himself as someone, because some um, inventors or great men of science can be very aware of the hands of destiny on them in the same way some politicians can be did he think he was going to be someone who who changed the way empires and nations functioned or what was he hoping for something more humble and practical or was it both more you know you, you this is a great question because it really gets to the the key tension of the whole book which it's not at all what he had intended he has a list from the late 1880s of what he was trying to deliver with his engine which was a, a rural uh, power source, something small, because in the, in the era of the steam engines, someone like his father in a little workshop, well, the steam engine is about the size of the workshop. It just wasn't a practical power source for him. And what diesel intended was a small, compact power source that could enable woodworkers and carvers and dentistry shops and things like that. Ultimately, that didn't work out to be the case. Really, it was the Tesla electric motor that serviced those small rural needs. and the diesel engine, ironically, did the exact opposite of what Rudolf wanted. While he was looking for decentralized economies and rural power sources, the diesel engine became the primary mode of power for centralized big business and as well implements of war. And this comes, comes back to the, the motivation for Kaiser Wilhelm II to kill him. The diesel engine by 1913 had emerged as the only option to power a U-boat or submarine. Kerosene, gasoline engines wouldn't work. Of course, the steam engine's not going to work for undersea work. Uh, but with the diesel engine, it, the fuel efficiency is three to four times greater than gasoline and kerosene engines. So rather than just being able to ro roam sort of port uh, waters, you can get out into sea lanes and control shipping lanes. 100% uh, of boat fires come from gasoline engines, zero from diesel. So with submarines, you'd go under water and the fumes or fires would kill the crew. It just would never work. So by 1913, everyone recognized diesel is the only option and we have to build our submarine fleets. We're in the height of the Anglo 
uh, German naval arms race and the Kaiser sees a way forward. He can't compete on the dreadnoughts. The UK has a history and an infrastructure of building capital ships in a way that nobody can compete with. They're building dreadnoughts and enormous battleships. Germany can't do it, but maybe they can compete with U-boats. Um, and that, of course, puts diesel right at the center of it. So all of which he would never have wanted. He, he recognized the value of a military. His life was really bookended by European wars. Uh, so he recognized the value of a, a military to sort of stave off attack and and keep yourself safe from the social Darwinism of the time. Um, but he was he was really more of a peaceful uh, person. And so by the end of his life, he watches this irony sort of play out that his engine has been used for for reasons he never intended. Well, that I means sort of brings me to my next question because I think m me, you, everyone here, everyone, in fact. It is standing on the precipice of another era in which there are many warnings and concerns about the um, the march of technology turning into a sprint. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our case of artificial intelligence, and it, it does seem to be that society is speeding along, again, a little bit like the Titanic. It's receiving all of these ice warnings and, and we're actually speeding up rather than slowing down. Uh, I've heard you use the, the phrase, and since you used it doug i can't really get it out of my head it's one of the this word the phrase that grabbed me technical sweetness uh to describe the seductive dangers and i think they are it's important to note they are seductive dangers of scientists pushing forward with their research and their work because they can not necessarily because they should uh, and the, i mean the great example of that in the history of science is fairly obviously oppenheimer mm -hmm. and the bomb was there ever a moment with diesel where he felt similar fears or concerns or by the time he felt those concerns had his technology already sort of gotten out of his hands yes and i think it happened in the you know in the in this sort of mid 1910 like 1905 in that range give or take because in the early 1900s 1901 two, three, he really was so focused on making sure the engine could work uh, he, he first unveiled it in 1897 and it probably could have used another couple of years in the laboratory. It wasn't quite ready for prime time. And so his various partners around the world, the, the licensing model at the time was that you would license the exclusive rights to manufacture and market the diesel engine by national territory. So in North America, we had Adolphus Bush take it to power things here and various countries were moving forward, but they were not moving forward easily. All of them needed his help to sort of come in there and get them over these hurdles that might have been better worked out in the lab before it was brought out to, you know, national licensees around the world. Uh, and so in those years, he was so focused on getting over that hurdle, making it work. The French were putting it behind, you know, in front of the propellers of ships on, on barges, shallow draft barges around the canal system of France. And they were working on the first submarines as well. And so he was working in league with his partners, who he became very close with many of his partners around the world, names that you would know, the Nobels in Russia and, uh, you know, others around the world. And they were, they were making progress. And he was writing to Germany, to the German Navy, that you guys need to get on this because the Germans were much more focused on the battleships. They're, they still had their eye over on the British across the sea there. And they were, and Tirpitz was focused on battleships, not on the submarine. And in fact, of the major powers, Germany was the last of all of them to order a diesel-powered submarine, even though diesel is, Rudolf himself is right there with them. So he was running around trying to solve these problems through 02, 03, 04, 05. And there are letters that Rudolf wrote to his partners in 03 saying, when are the Germans going to order some diesel engines from us? You know, we've, we've got to tell these guys that, you know, France and everybody else is doing really well. Like, it works. They should do it. But by 05, 06, 07, he, became, he seemed to become more alarmed with German nationalism and militarism and the focus of the Kaiser on this naval arms race with Great Britain. Uh, of course, there's already trouble in the Balkans. Everyone's colonies are rubbing up, up against each other. And he was feeling an impending sense of military conflict on a big scale. And at that time, Germany was suddenly recognized the value of the diesel engine for the U-boats. And they wanted to wrap their arms around the technology and keep it within German borders and not have Rudolf um, share. So Rudolf worked for MA, Machinenfabrik Augsburg. And Germany eventually told them not to share new design plans 
with foreign companies. Um, and that really went against Rudolph's sort of international spirit. He was very much about this international community of licensees should be sharing and one big knowledge base, all advances with a diesel engine so that all can benefit. And uh, his letters and his tone changed from 0203, 1902, 1903 of, I wish Germany would get behind this to, I, I don't want Germany to keep this to themselves. We need to make sure others have access. And so, uh, and I, I, as you say, Earl, I love that term, technical sweetness. I think he yeah. was in that mode from 1902, three, four of let's make this work and not really thinking of, well, the submarine is a pretty horrible stealth weapon. And that's really not the best use of my engine. Later, he might have been thinking, he sort of might have recognized, I suppose, that he was suffering from technical sweetness in those days, but the cat was out of the bag by that time. I mean, everybody was building submarine fleets. Yeah, I can't remember whether it was, which is a terror. I don't know why I launched myself into the sentence to show up. I don't know it, but it's either Disraeli or Oscar Wilde. One of them said um, that there are two tragedies in life. One is not getting what you want and the other is getting it. And looking, <laughs> and looking at the... Um, looking at the life of diesel and a lot of these inventors it sort of is the truth of that you hunger and hunger for it and then realize once you've been fed by it, it it's poisonous we've meant i briefly mentioned it before on the subject of the titanic one of the disasters eventual victims the journalist william t stead called diesel the great magician of the world which is another phrase i love hmm. and stead also wrote a book a very prescient book called the americanization of the world in which he predicted the 20th century would be as dominated by america as the 19th had been by britain we, we've talked about his awareness of this of the this, what was called the concert of europe was about to cl crash into itself and all the tensions of edwardian europe but what was his relationship like with with America? Did he have the same conclusions about it that his admirer Stead had? And, and, and how did he come to be so involved in America and its oil industry? He made two trips to America, one in 1904 and one in 1912. And he kept detailed journals as, as only a, both an engineer and social theorist could do. He captured so much information, a real 360 look at it from a European's point of view. And it's some of the most charming stuff I went through. And I, I hope some of that charm is delivered onto the page of the book. I, I think it is. And he had an evolving, in, in 04 in particular, he went over there and he was really appalled at the infrastructure. You know, he's come from a youth in Paris where by 1900, they had a metro, an underground metro, a sewer system that you could row a boat down, you know, a, a city of marble and stone that supports a million people. And he'd come to these towns in America that were thrown up nearly overnight, almost all out of wood. Uh, you know, one interesting thing to note in Great Britain, where there are tons of coal, the rail system ran mainly on coal, as, as you know, and in America, there were, there were trees everywhere for a time. And the rail system ran largely on wood, they would just throw wood in there and, and to use as their fuel for the steam engine. And these towns would go up largely of wood. And the number one fear of Americans at that time in these towns was fire. And so there'd be metal staircases running out of the second floor windows of most of these wooden homes. And there'd be barrels of water everywhere to deal with the fires. And still whole neighborhoods would go up in flames routinely. So he, he was struck by that, like by the architecture and the way the homes and the towns were built. There was no sewer. There was no way to even handle the, the runoff of big rains, even in big cities. He remarked, I'd, I'd walk down the sidewalks of a big city and we're like, it's impassable. You can't get down the sidewalk because it's six inches of water and mud everywhere you go. Uh, but he, he came back in 12 and more and more he was falling in love with America. He would, he would sail from uh, Europe and remark how nice it was to leave this class system of Europe behind and get to America. It felt more of a meritocracy and, and not so oriented around social class that, uh, he also uh, found the opportunity to sort of build from scratch, where in Europe, all throughout Europe, roads and, and designs are made to fit the ancient pathways of Rome, where in America, if it makes sense to build a road there, that's where you build it. You know, you're starting from scratch and doing it the way, you know, an engineer, what, an engineer might want to do it from the beginning. And there's, there are also some hilarious observations. He would just, he couldn't get over how Americans eat. He's like, they, they eat so much. And in these <laughs> crazy combinations, of food. They eat ice cream at least once a meal, sometimes twice a meal. 
so he, there were some just funny, funny observations uh, of him. The, the amount of guns out in the West, he's like, you know, there are grannies walking down the street with a six shooter, you know, the, con the conductors on trains are all armed to the teeth, uh, things like that, that were very different from his background in Europe. Um, well, so it's a really fun, charming thing is, is meeting with Edison later is uh, also a charming scene of the book. Yeah, it is. That's actually just what I was about to say. If anyone, I suppose this is sort of a personal predilection as a reader, but I love works of history that also can sometimes segue into or feel a little bit like a travel guide to the past. And, and I think this book has it because you did, first of all, I think what he captured and what you captured through him was the extraordinary pace of change between say 1904 and 1912 and just how much had it had improved mm -hmm. and and certainly because i can remember reading there was an account of the archduke franz ferdinand visited america in the 1890s and he was like we've nothing to worry about we're completely fine <laughs> um and um and then he changed his mind although interestingly he came back and he said you know to his uncle the emperor who fatally didn't listen Mm -hmm. you've got you've got we've got to borrow this federalist thing that they have going on it's the only way we can hold austria together mm -hmm. and nobody listened um but it but that was one thing that came out his observation and just also unlike many great scientists he really seemed to like people he liked to watch this country around him that was very very charming in the book that's a great word for it for someone to move on to pivot to my next question he was not noted for an abundance of charm We've already touched on his imperial and royal ma and royal majesty, the German emperor, uh, Wilhelm II, who I've written about him before. He is, I think, politely, you could say, a mass of contradictions. And yeah. I was so, yeah, he's um, he's a, he's interesting and um, exhausting. And uh, one of the things I was so impressed with in this book, Doug, was the way you were quite fair to him. And also, I think sometimes he's cartoonish and villainous mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you captured a lot of his inherent contradictions. And it's those contradictions I wanted to talk about because in some ways, he, you, you know, the, the book remains centered on Diesel, but it kind of it made the Kaiser more relevant by comparing to a similar trait in them, which was this question of dual identity or, or triple identity. And, and the Kaiser... I think a lot of people are surprised when they discover he was half British and he, he's constantly dealing with, you, you present him as someone who's dealing with on the one hand, the legacy of being the son of this liberal, pro-liberal British princess. And on the other hand, the heir to a very strident German nationalist legacy. And he never quite, well, he never, it's not quite, never at all merges those tendencies sort of slamming against each other. And they create many of his mistakes. And then in contrast, there's Diesel, who I think, yes, yeah, we talked about those dual identities merged together quite beautifully. Um, how do you think those that that dual identity respectively shaped the Kaiser versus Rudolf Diesel? It's an incredible contrast there. I I I, I uh, I'm glad you you picked up on that and 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 uh, saw what what was going on there too, because with Wilhelm, as you say, he was Queen Victoria's favorite grandson. Her eldest daughter married a German prince. And so Kaiser Wilhelm II was cousins with the, the future German king, also cousins with a future Russian czar. Uh, and he had a physical deformity from birth. His his yeah. one arm was shorter than the other. And but the mother was saying, you've got to be a horse. You know, any any German emperor is going to have to be able to ride the horse and do these other yeah. things. And so he'd be in tears constantly through his youth. And I found him to be a very sympathetic character. Uh, yeah, the, the childhood sense. stuff is quite, and that I mean, I think you brought it out quite sensitively because I think I don't know if you remember this, but when we were younger, it used to be if you heard about his arm, it kind of was presented in a, in a way that you made fun of him for having mm -hmm. this slight defect. And actually, what comes out in the book is just how difficult it would have been to have yeah. any kind of impairment like that at that time. Yeah, especially when there's zero sympathy coming from your mother, you know, only disappointment yeah. and sort of a little bit of shame, and you know, I wish my son could run with balance instead of you know so i i do i did find it to be a sympathetic character in that sense and you can see the the path that took him to being this sort of tortured adult um he always was visiting uh over in the uk and envy you know the royal navy of course was the the pride of of uh really the world i mean controlled the seas since the time of napoleon and so he envied that and uh, and wanted that. And he was also proud of his British heritage, but hated it. And he was in the middle of this power struggle, even within Germany, because 
Bismarck, of course, as always pulling strings, recognized that the Wilhelm I, you know, Wilhelm II's grandfather, was old and not going to be there forever. Wilhelm II's father, Frederick, was far more liberal, as was his mother. Bismarck is a real conservative. He he does he does not want that. So he starts to bring Wilhelm II along more in the vein of the Prussian uh, conservative style. Um, and then, of course, Wilhelm II's father passes away very early. So suddenly, Wilhelm's in there as emperor. And, and I love the uh, quote. It's one of the British prime ministers. You probably know the one sort of makes the quip that Bismarck kind of, in a sense, created this Frankenstein monster. You know, he turned him into this more conservative guy, but then he gets rid of Bismarck and takes <laughs> full charge himself. Uh, whereas, you know, so those those conflicting things, you know, the Bismarck side, the mother side, the German, the British is always at conflict there. And it's, it's this constant tug of war. You can see it happening within him. It's never anything in harmony. Whereas with Diesel, it, you get the sense it's much more that the, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, that all these things sort of work together in a way that enhances and magnifies the best parts of each. You know, he, he took the best of the French and the Germans and the English and the Americans. And somehow that mix uh, just came out for the best. Whereas in Wilhelm, it was, it just was self-destructive. Yeah, that's, there was another quote about him that I jotted down. I, I always butcher it, but as I was reading the book and preparing for this, I thought this is sort of very much the, the Kaiser of this book, which is that um, the Tsar's mother was a, a Danish princess by birth, but she loathed, I mean, just despised Wilhelm. Mm. And she said on the subject of seagoing, she always, she's told her son, do not, you know, when you visit him, you go on his yacht. Do not let him come on ours because he's so greedy and vulgar. He'll immediately try to build one bigger than our one the minute he sees it. So they were constantly, and, and Franz Ferdinand, you know, was wearing sort of ridiculous uniform. And he said, oh, don't worry, no matter how bad I look, William will be even more overdressed. So he was just, he was sort of mocked by, by the other royals as well. But there was a sense of someone who just... Yeah, I think that was, it made me admire Diesel more almost, just seeing how everything had flowed together and then pity the Kaiser to see everything slamming into itself. And for Diesel, though, despite, I think, as you say, I love that the sum was greater than the, the, um, the sorry, the total was greater than the sum of the parts. Despite that and this world he really believes in, the 1900s, as you've mentioned, progressively become a much tougher decade for him. And it's led both personally and professionally, I should say. And I think... It has led to a very enduring theory that I certainly thought before I read your book, you know, when when I remember hearing this years ago, that Diesel was one of the geniuses I heard referred to as someone who died bankrupt and that he was kind of financially decimated mm -hmm. by the by the time of his death. Is that true? Was he was he a bankrupt? It's hard to know. It's hard to know. That certainly was speculation in the papers. It wasn't speculation right away, but after he been missing for several days and so so listeners know he disappeared on september 29 and then media speculation went rampant for about 11 days until there was a story that a corpse was discovered floating uh in the north sea uh along the coast of uh, of of uh, the flushing coast and people in a boat pulled the body alongside and they went through the pockets and found four identifying items, but then returned the body to the waves. So there's no, no body and evidence really, but they came back with four items that were, that basically identified that corpse. And it was in that 11 day range that things started coming to the newspapers talking about his bankruptcy and, and uh, you know, a sorry state of his financial affairs. And so that was some of the reporting at the time. And then biographers have also mentioned that there in the English language, there are really two biographies that go deeper into some of this. One was from the 60s, it was co-authored. And then the other more thorough one is from the 80s by Donald Thomas. And it's interesting, uh, the first biography that's co-authored, the authors differ on whether it was suicide or not. One, one is firm that it's suicide. The other says probably suicide, but I'm open-minded, could be something else. And then of the, the biography in the 80s, Donald Thomas is 100% firm, it was suicide. And in there, he makes a case about the bankruptcy and the financial ruin of Diesel at, at, by 1913. And he has a passage in there. He lists some things about the, the financial ruin and says, by the summer of 1913, Diesel knew that he was bankrupt. And then there's a little end note there. And then if you skip to the end notes, 
uh, you know, as only some do, some do, some don't. If you do, the end note says, there's absolutely no evidence uh, of the bankruptcy. Um, there are no documents. Um, but, you know, there was also a fire, diesel set a fire to his place in, in 1913. So it's possible that he would have taken any evidence of bankruptcy and burned it there. And that might be why there's no evidence. Uh, so he seems to be going off the newspaper reporting um, because there is no document, it, which is interesting, by the way, if, if someone is bankrupt, the person who is most likely to maintain a document would be the person holding the note, not not diesel. But there is no evidence of the bankruptcy, although that was wide speculation at the time. And and uh, one biographer in particular, um, you know, makes that that claim as well, based on the speculation at the time. Well, it was. I mean, it's one of the many mysteries of him. But I think what emerges from the book is what is someone who was is very clearly drawn, and it is an extraordinary biography. And before I open up to questions, though, there's I'm aware that not every biographer wants to meet um, the people that they've written about. Um, sometimes because they don't want to be disappointed, sometimes because they know that they'll be horrified. Um, but you spent a very long time, Doug, in the in the, in the spectral mm. company of this fascinating man. Would you like to have dinner with him? And if if you could, is there a question or something you'd want to talk about most? I would like to have dinner. I'm, I'm flipping to a page here because I just want to read his words as I get to the end of this. I would love to have dinner with him. I feel like I have had that in my mind's eye 50 times. He's been walking around with me and my kids and my wife. And uh, he's like a character in our home because we talk about the disappearance and the, the investigation. I mean, the book really, it's a biography of the man, but then it turns into an investigation of the disappearance and, a, and solving the mystery of what happened to him. And uh, I just, you know, as a biographer, you know, um, you know, you don't want to fall too much in love with your subject. You know, you got to be fair and, and keep things down the middle. Um, but I, I really did come to respect him so much, and I would like to talk to him. And I, if I was able to speak with him, I would want to get to the point you raised earlier around the technical sweetness and how he feels about the 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 role of the diesel engine in the 120 years since his disappearance. Now, on the one hand, it powers everything; it powers our global economy. And I've I've gone through this spiel before, but if you imagine a piece of fruit grown in a tropical region. Every piece of heavy machinery and farm equipment used to grow that piece of fruit is diesel. It gets loaded onto a truck. Anything on the road larger than a passenger car is diesel. It goes, it goes down to port where a crane, diesel powered, loads, loads it onto a cargo ship. All cargo ships around the world, diesel. Goes into across the oceans to another port, loaded onto another truck, onto a train. Throughout the 20th century, for the most part, diesel for, for the trains. I mean, really nothing moves without the diesel engine to this day. And the fundamental aspect of it is still the compression engine of the bicycle tire pump we talked about. It's still fundamentally the same engine he introduced in 1897. Um, but it's also been the, uh, the power source for the, one of the most horrible weapons in two world wars. I mean, it's done, you know, it has not been the engine of rural decentralized economies. It's been the engine of, of big business. And so, uh, I wanted to read one line here from Diesel that's at the end of the book. It's not a spoiler <laughs> because th this tension exists throughout the book. But Diesel writes, it is wonderful to design and to invent in the way that an artist designs and creates. But whether it all has a purpose, whether people have become happier as a result, that I can no longer decide. And so he wrote those words near the end of his life. Um, and I'd be interested to revisit with him that thought, that concept 120 years later. Incredible. And that is, I mean, I remember reading that, but that's a very, very profound quote. And also I think indicative of the of a different kind of intelligence to his scientific intelligence, which is the ability to self-reflect, which is not a, a gift granted to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I find that fascinating, Doug. I'm sure people listening have too. And so I think... We can take some questions for the next ten or so minutes from from any from any listeners. Just check the call here. Okay. And Doug, can I ask also before I open this up? Did you where did you travel to for it? Uh, well, throughout the U.S. And then one of the interesting things about this book is while I was researching it. 
it was in the middle of COVID. And so I couldn't get into many of the archives. So in the end, Paris was, was the place, but a lot of the stuff in Germany, I didn't get into until the very end. And I was developing digital remote relationships with people who work in these archives for, for a period of time, even the archivists couldn't get into their own archives. They were, everything was just yeah. closed down. Then finally only the archivists could go in, but no one else. And so they could scan and email things back out. Um, but as you can imagine, secondary research in the time of COVID has some challenges, but I did get to Paris on a family trip as well, where I went and found his childhood home where he lived these, these first. And is it, uh, is it still there? Is it the it building? Is, the, the exterior wall is still there. And it's okay. one of the saddest things you'll ever see, especially if you've read this book and go see it, because on the wall, there's only this little plaque about a foot by a foot. It's above your head. So it's not even in your, in your sight line as you walk around. So people walk underneath this thing all the time without having any idea. The wall itself is covered with graffiti and stickers. And it's just this sad little thing. All it says is, you know, this was Rudolf Diesel's childhood home. And uh, that for the man who has delivered the world the primary power source. Again, that piece of fruit doesn't get from A to B and yeah. hasn't for the last hundred years without diesel. And he should be up there with Ford, Edison, Tesla, cool. and the Wright brothers, Marconi, and he's not. He's 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 gets a lowercase D, which that is when's the last time you saw Ford lowercase F? Right. It was funny. I had lunch with my mother today and I said, Oh, I'm you know, was chatting about what I was doing. And she went, Oh, is is diesel a surname? And I went, Oh, I wish you were just devastated Doug Brown at this stage. That's so <laughs> unfair. <laughs> just sort of a heat-seeking missile of a question. Uh, um, I'm going to start a campaign to bring back the uppercase D for diesel. Yeah, but I, I mean, I kind of, I get, I'm not, I, I know I'll never be able to write it lowercase again. Like it will have festered <laughs> into my mind to, to keep it, to keep it uppercase. Um, I'm just going to check actually, Doug, because I'm not sure. I'm just checking how to bring in the questions. And I think it's, it's Omar might be um, fielding them from the Mark Twain yeah, um, I'm I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. It's uh, I've asked people to put in the Q and A, and I don't. See okay, sorry, I'll I'll keep an eye on that then. Um, yeah. and so was it an interesting thing though, Doug? Because I, yeah, I I was working a book through COVID as well, and it was um, and and worse was it was um, it, it was a by a, a palace, and I pitched it as like it's the only palace from that period that's still there. I can go and see it. Um, and it was worse after COVID walking around and thinking, oh my God, what if I round the corner and I've completely missed this? I've got the wings wrong and the rooms wrong and the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> Incorrect. Um, but it is, it's a very different experience, I think, when you can see it online. But when you go in person and see these things, it does create a much stronger sort of physical or emotional reaction it, in the author it, when you see it. It was emotional. What One other place that I went to in Paris was, so from his home, his childhood favorite museum was 150 yards away. And so I made that walk. The museum still exists. It's a converted nice. converted abbey. So it's one of the oldest buildings in Paris and uh, it's a technical museum. So we went in there and it has many of the exhibits that were there even when he was there in the 1860s. So the old Cougnot steam car, this early steam engine car that can go about one mile an hour that burns an enormous amount of fuel but was used to haul heavy things. And and King Louis at the time wanted to use it for the military to haul cannon and things. But that's in there. An early early version of the diesel engine is in there. Oh, good. And then other than that, though, it's like old hair dryers and things that, you know, are, are uh, you know, from our childhood, typewriters and things like that. And so walking around our third um, grade class trips and things like that to look at these old things there yeah. that are... Let me tell you, I went to a museum where they had put, I actually felt it was almost an act of violence. It was so offensive that it was put in a museum. They had put um, like a portable CD player in a museum. And I was like, this has made me feel 374 years old. So we have we have a question from Debbie. Uh, did you come across anyone interesting in your research that you didn't know much about before? And is there another book on the horizon based on your research? It's two questions there. That is a great question. Um, the first question is yes, and I'll, and I'll mention a few. The, the quick answer uh, to the second question is that I, I have a, a running joke with, with my editor, and, and this may not be ours, Gareth, you may have the same joke with yours, but one <laughs> writer's footnote can be another writer's whole book. Yeah, you know, and I in my case, that's true, yeah. <laughs> 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 that is true. <laughs> so in my case, I think 
it's possible that one of my footnotes may, may be my own next book. I love this period, this sort of Gilded Age mm. period of time, the quarter century running up to World War One. I. I jokingly refer to it as Downton Abbey, the early seasons, you know, before <laughs> yeah. we hit that... <laughs> before we hit that hinge point of history where we really started yeah. living in a different way. I know you've written and studied a ton of this, Gareth, you know, it's think of how many empires collapsed as a result of world right. war one. I. I mean, urbanization and that was already happening, but it was certainly accelerated by world war one. Uh, but I, I love that period. I feel like it's under written. I mean, there's so much on world war two. Um, and I actually used to be more of a world war two person, you know, it's got the star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, right. good and evil element to it. But I Absolutely. find World War One to be more nuanced and fascinating in that sense. Like you were talking about the pettiness between uh, Nikki and and uh, Wilhelm. Yeah. And it exists between Edward and Wilhelm too. And like this weird, it's like, you know, that's not the whole reason why people went to war, but it certainly, certainly didn't help, you know. Uh, no. So anyway, it, it'll probably be in that period. There are characters from the book that will be involved. There are so many characters. Uh, Count Zeppelin, I came across, just to name a few characters in the book yeah. that are fascinating. Early Churchill, I did not know as much about. Uh, you know, we think of Churchill as a World War II person, but he was first Lord of the Admiralty before World War II. He was first Lord of the Admiralty before World War I, ultimately responsible for the British Navy's preparation for war in both cases, in both wars. Adolphus Bush, the founder of Anheuser-Busch, was a diesel pioneer in America. He had the license. He used it to power his breweries to pump water, but he also built submarine diesels for the U.S. Navy. Chester Nimitz, a, hum a huge World War II figure for America, was a diesel specialist and traveled to Germany in 1912 uh, to learn more about diesel, to come back to America to refit our, our uh, naval fleet with diesel. So, so many little stories in here, some wonderful, charming footnotes, and one of those is likely to be the next book. Brilliant. I mean, I, I love the the period is understudied. So this is, I mean, I, and I think it's, I, I mean, I've said this to you, but when we were preparing for this, to me, Rudolf Diesel is almost like a kind of engineering's Anastasia in that it's the Edwardian period produces us with these last great mysteries of people vanishing and it's on the cusp of science but antiquity as well it's it's extraordinary uh, and funny there was a there's a quote that always sticks in my head from one of Wilhelm's cousins Princess uh, Marie Louise of Schleswig-Holstein and she lived to attend the coronation of Elizabeth II years later but she said in her memoirs, you know, there's been so much written about the recent war, by which she meant World War II. But in order to understand everything that's happened, you young people must understand the First Great War. And I think she was right. I think the First World War was changed things in a way we we still don't fully engage with as popularly as we do the Second World War. Yeah, it's true. I think we're still digesting it when yeah. the second one broke out. And then it was like, my God, you know, so you know, I think a lot of that has been... I think, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I said, when you talked about the the nuance of the First World War, I think maybe that's part of it. I think there's something kind of terrifying. When you look at the sheer scale of horror and the loss of life in the Second World War, there is a moral comfort from knowing that that was worth it, that what we were fighting against was so, unappall was so appallingly evil, that that sacrifice is worthwhile. But when you look at what was done to a continent and millions upon millions of people in the First World War. And actually, at the end of it, everyone was worse off than they mm -hmm. have been before. It becomes much more difficult to really look at it and not feel... And, and there's that. also a sense of everyone like, why did we just do all this? I yeah. don't quite get it. And uh, there's some interesting books on it too. I, I, you know, the sort of prevailing wisdom is it was Germany's fault. And certainly the right. Treaty of Versailles made it clear it was Germany's fault. Yeah. Uh, but more and more, you see some writing like the Sleepwalkers that are a little more yeah, boom chilling. balanced on that. They, they, you know, yeah. it also gave a little more information on the Balkans than I had known, and you know, it was sort of making the point like, well, the French weren't exactly, you know, uh, no. trying to calm things down either. No, so. oh, they they weren't. And there's a, there's a fantastic. It's actually one of those moments where you think you you could feel the chill come off the pages, but it was a junior member of the Austrian royal family. She, Matt, she was literally the Empress consort, but she was in conversation with the aged emperor Franz Josef after the war. And it suddenly dawns on her that he feels like they all lost control of this after Franz Ferdinand's death. And, and he, he's, you know, he's trying to say to her, she says something very simplistic, like, but we're in the right. They shot the future emperor. And he says, it's about 300 different things. And that's only one of them. And you realize she realizes that this continent's tipped into a war. And no one really knew what they were doing. 
which is um, <laughs> horrible when you think about the fact that these were some great and brilliant minds and they all kind of had a vague idea that they shouldn't be doing this and it still happened, which doesn't give you a great amount of confidence in, in any government since, to be totally honest. <laughs> it, it certainly should be quite, quite frightened. Let me just yeah, check. yeah. And, and, but, and to round it back, Diesel played a far bigger role in World War One than I think previously realized because even oh, even the Admiralty they weren't really talking about you know they were talking about submarines but I don't think people were you know at, at you know the the real technical people understood it's got to be diesel but no one else was really thinking that diesel was some sort of game changer for the seas unless unless you were you know building the ships yourself and understood that right and it's strange that the, the, if he um uh. I was about to give away the ending. It's his um public career ceases right before whatever mm -hmm. the conclusion of the book is before the war begins. But it's really this global cataclysm where you see him come ironically to, to full prominence. Um, I think that is us with time up. Um, Omar, I just want I'm conscious of everyone's time, but it um I just from having been a panelist, this has been absolutely fascinating, Doug. And I would so encourage people who love anything about the history of science. The history of America or the history of royal families in Europe and the First World War to, to buy the book because it, it is absolutely as a historian, it, it was something that I didn't know and was consistently fascinated by. So the mysterious case of Rudolf Diesel is, is a must for history readers. I think people will love it. Thank you. So thank you for the insightful questions. It was really it was so fun talking to you. I'm looking forward to getting together on the same continent one of these days. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's what Rudolf would want. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Gareth, for acting as moderator. And of course, Doug, thank you so much. Um, this uh, has been amazing. And a lot of us are looking forward to reading the book. Um, please, uh, please buy the book. You can buy it through us, uh, through our website, um, or you can buy it through whatever way is best for you. Um, just buy it. Um, and please join us again um, in the future. Um, look at our events calendar and see what's uh, coming up. We have a lot of events coming up this fall um, with a diverse amount of uh, diverse topics and, and authors. Um, so thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.